George Whitfield, welcome to Tuscaloosa. I hope you're doing well, sir. Thank you so much. Ryan Fowler, thank you for having me on. Tide 99-1. I know this is a, this is a legendary uh, sports sports talk show, so I'm very honored to get a chance to join you today. Well, I'm I'm we have been quarterback conversation heavy uh, for uh, the weeks in Tuscaloosa, and I'll sort of set the stage. Uh, Alabama's a quarterback away uh, from being back in Atlanta and playing for the SEC championship, uh, being in the college football finals. Uh, they have an elite team. Uh, defense, out of this world. Going to be great. Uh, offensive line, going to be solid. We know the backs in the backfield, but it's all about that most important position. As you get to know – uh, the quarterbacks and what it takes to win at a high level like the SEC, I thought we'd pick your brain for just a few minutes. And I, I want to start off just talking about your credentials because I, I think that really sets the foundation for where you and I are going to go and talk about Blake Barnett. But just talk about how you got into this. Where, where did the fascination with quarterback development come from? Sure. Um I remember being a kid, like all of us were in the backyard, we're playing uh, football, but I grew up in Massillon, Ohio, and I know Alabama and the South, football's religion, so I don't know what you'd call it in Ohio. It seemed like, you know, it was football or fist fighting, and that was about it. Um, but son of a football coach, uh, there for the Massillon Tigers, and I remember loving Walter Payton and loving Barry Sanders until my cousin said, you can run all over the field like that and throw it and be the one to break the huddle. And I jumped over to quarterback. And so I grew up playing quarterback. I played at Maslin. I went to Youngstown State with Jim Trussell, finished and graduated out of Tiffin University, and it just continued. I spent a year at the University of Iowa as a, uh, as a, like a junior coach, like a restricted earnings coach, uh, cut my teeth, jumped over to arena football, still had it in me. And then I landed in San Diego. Um, I thought I was gearing up for law school. I thought that was the direction I was going to go. And the family out here approached me about working with their fourth grade son. And uh, we started working together through the summertime. I didn't consider myself a coach at the time. I just knew I'm working with this young guy named Mikey, who I had to take a knee on the ground so I could be eye to eye with him just so we could communicate at that time and in the fall every week I got a few more calls from somebody who played against him or coached against him and then you know by that Thanksgiving you know I had you know 18 20 young guys and then it snowballed and then um, I got a chance to intern with the San Diego Chargers when Phillip Rivers a rookie so I was their quarterback intern so I learned an awful lot there that was a lot like uh Imagine, Ryan, you're a science teacher in junior high. You're a junior high science teacher, and it's like NASA calling and saying, you can come in here and intern with us for about five or six months. So your knowledge of science just, you lose everything you thought you knew about science because you just pick up all this new stuff. That expedited it. Finally get a high school guy. That was a celebration. Then you finally get a college quarterback to work with. That was a celebration. And then in 2010... I got a chance to work with Ben Roethlisberger when he was suspended, and that kind of set the stage uh, for us, education-wise. How do you work with these great big guys? Uh, how do you stay a step ahead of them psychologically? You know, the, the, the path, the pace, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ben brought on Cam Newton. Cam Newton brought on Andrew Luck. Uh, Andrew Luck. Uh, brought on Landry Jones, who was at the time like an all-time passer in the Big 12. That brought on a young third stringer from Texas A&M at the time uh, in Johnny Manziel. And, and I love that process because he wasn't even starting at A&M. You know, we got a chance to meet, and uh, it was fun to kind of be side-by-side side with him through that pace. And, uh, and then Jameis. Winston this year and Bryce Petty, and, and it's just kind of each at-bat set up the next at-bat. And I remember a very famous coach telling me, it's what you do in the moment. And if you can do well in the moment and the opportunity they give you, you'll get enough. And uh, I just always kind of stuck with that. And uh, fortunately, we've had quite a few at-bats. 
George, I, I want to sort of set the stage. I, I've rarely ever tell my audience this, so uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm get, you get, you're getting me to disclose something that I don't, I don't talk a lot about. Um, uh, I'm a grad student here at the University of Alabama, and I'm working on a couple of different uh, degrees. And mm-hmm. uh, one is a, a, a doctoral degree here at Alabama. It's, uh, it, it's in kinesiology, but it's not in mechanics like what you do. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm more in physical activity accelerometer study, and, and I don't want to bore people with stats, but I'm, I'm a stats guy. That's what I love to do, analyze stats uh, from a CDC. Sure. Okay, so if, if I feel like a kid in a candy store because I'm picking your brain, uh, I just sure. apologize, okay? I want to hey, talk. I, I love this. Okay, so I want to talk about what it takes to be a big-time quarterback, and, and I'm going to talk about the work ethic side of it and, and the mechanics and, and how you're able just to tweak – just a little thing, and you get more velocity, more torque. Talk about that as far as how you identify and go through the process of, of grooming these quarterbacks. to Because you don't just walk the way that the, the, the alums that you've worked with, you, don't, you spot that with the eye, but you also use other techniques. Can you talk about those for a couple of minutes? Sure. Uh, well, to, to talk about it, we got to kind of – just walk the audience through what's been conventional. And All right, we, 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 we have three hours, so we'll be with you until nine. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm, I apologize. I, I'm just aggravated. No, I'm in. So, no, so, uh, well, originally, old school thinking in terms of quarterback, and it, 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 it lended itself to success then, is when you talk to NFL scouts, front office people, how they measured a, a, an elite NFL prospect, a kid coming out of college. It used to be you needed 32 to 35 starts. You needed to be between 6'2 and 6'4. Anything above 6'4 is a plus up into a point. Shorter than 6'2, you, you had to have something extraordinary, you know, to overcome said height disadvantage. And then you needed to be in the 60s in completion percentage. And then you needed to win, I think, like 60% of your ball games. So, some of that stuff has kind of been distorted. Some of that stuff holds true. I do agree that the starts, the flight time, is, is probably the most important out of all that stuff. Um, and I say that because height, with the way the game is now being played, and it's being widened out and spread out and everything, it, it's not so much of a ISO, downhill, you know, climb up in the pocket off a seven-step drop and find your way through. It's not that anymore. You know, guys... You know, uh, location points and, and, and their and their vision scope is now preset five yards. Most everybody's playing the gun now, collegiately, so you can see. So that kind of dissipates the height thing. The completion percentage, you know, I still kind of smile at that. You got guys hitting seventy-five, eighty percent of the passes. They say they go complete, but half of those seem like they're behind the line of scrimmage. So completions don't seem to be doing a whole lot for me. Flight time. The hours that these young pilots are behind the wheel learning how to fly, I think, is most essential. And that comes to the amount of games we're playing. Very, very few quarterbacks, only two in the modern era, have gone in the first round off of one year starting experience uh, in the BCS. Do you know who those two guys are? I do not. They're, they're both in the NFL right now. One's an SEC guy, one's a Pac-12 guy. One year starting experience in the BCS, First round quarterback. Help me. Cam Newton. Oh, wow. is one. Sure. And Mark Mark Sanchez, oh. although he played a little bit as a sophomore, both those two guys had, you know, both had one year's starting experience. That's how rare that is. So now you'll see some guys come in now with two, and they're getting younger, like Jameis and and uh, and Johnny. You know, both hit home runs, redshirt freshman years, and they followed it up their sophomore years and out. So whether they're ready or not, they're coming out. Uh, so I think flight time is most important. How many hours do you have out there behind the wheel, in the huddle, in circumstances, situations, you know, uh, cutting your teeth, et cetera. It's the experiences that you're going to have to rely on and give to the NFL. So today's game now, I think the two most important, three most important aspects to, to, to play physically, tangible, your skill set, your overall skill set. So you have some kind of sustainable mechanics, 
just basically meaning you can repeat the same thing over and over. So if I'm throwing a hitch, you, you know, and you throw a hundred hitches and they dot them, like at a target range, that ball should be in the same, you know, two foot radius, not way above the head. Somebody made a diving catch, this one's behind, et cetera, et cetera, because the ball is all over the place. That means your mechanics are all over the place. It always traces back. Second, from mechanics, and that also goes to footwork, is are you naturally accurate? And so when people say, well, what's the difference between one and two? Ryan, you're scrambling. You found your receiver, but there's a linebacker between you and the receiver. Some young quarterbacks will just say, that guy's covered, I'm coming off of it. And I'm talking your receiver's 20 yards downfield, the linebacker's 10, right between the two of you. Some guys wouldn't even attempt that. Some guys, and you can see them in the pros, they try to throw it through the linebacker. You know what, if I throw this harder, maybe it'll go through and maybe he won't see it. I just react to this by turning up the RPMs. That's not going to work. The ability to just play catch. That's my guy. I'm just going to just lightly distribute this ball over the linebacker's head. My receiver's running straight up the sideline. There's a corner running exactly with him, stride for stride. Hey, I can be the difference maker if I play this ball up over the corner down to my receiver. Just like you're playing basketball and you're trying to throw it to somebody in the post. But the game is very, very similar. Can I just teardrop this thing to where my guy can get it? So there's accuracy. Uh, and I would, you know, definitely say when you look at, uh, you know, the overall skill set, you know, just in terms of being able to play and you look at accuracy, it, o- it only works if you're upright. So you don't need to be Michael Vick. You don't have to be Johnny. You don't have to be Cam Newton. Superhero athleticism is not necessary, but being able to make the first guy miss is. And guys do that different ways. Tony Romo, you know, he'll, he'll slide, hold, wait, and you see what he's done. You know, J.J. Watt, some of those guys, he's crafty. Bob Burger will shrug you off. The luck can sidestep you or throw you off. Whatever your means of avoiding the first sack or the first defender, I think that's the new prerequisite athletically. And that's how I think guys can maintain in this league, like a Philip Rivers, like an Andy Dalton, guys who are never really celebrated athletically. They understand for their own skill set, they must be a part of the pass protection. You know, people at home, even the parents at home in little league games are always quick to get on the offensive line. Man, this offensive line is terrible, it's whatever. But you're saying every single play, five people have to prevent four or five other people, sometimes six, from going where they want to go. Like, imagine stopping a human from physically from blocking them from where they want to go. If one of those five linemen up front loses their matchup, the play should still continue. That's where the quarterback slides up, slides over, gets out of the pocket. Can, if you're physical enough, you throw the guy off. If you're a smaller, quicker guy, make the guy make a miss. That that's the part of the game where you're seeing an awful lot of focus, not just in college, but in the NFL, where the chains keep moving. And they keep on talking about extending the play. Well, you're extending the play because somebody disrupted the first part of it. And the timing should already be gone. Ball should be gone. Well, the ball's not gone because back here, me and the lineman had to make an extra adjustment. So those are your prerequisites. I think making a guy you must be able to deal with the defender naturally accurate, and then you have to have that skill set. Quick hands, quick eyes, and just, you know, just to be able to go out and kind of navigate your way. That's helped an awful lot. Now, when it comes into training, you're going to get guys different shapes, different sizes. You know, we've, we've seen quite a few models. Some of these guys come in like SUVs. Some of these guys come in like sports cars. But if they're all equipped, you know, with these baseline necessities, you can you can pretty well help them, you know, achieve that consistent success that they want. You're just gonna have to do it through whatever through whatever model they are. And then when you hit the ground, I know this is like a super long answer. No, 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 listen, I'm 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 enjoying every minute of it. Don't, don't stop. Please. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Hey, so, le- hey, let me ask you this. Audience. After you finish this, yeah. can, can I take a three minute break and then come back? And then ask you no about problem. Blake Bar. Okay, okay. I'm going to let you finish this All one, right. and I'll take a three-minute break because I, I am 
trust me, uh, my eyes are, are glazing over because I'm enjoying what you're saying. Well, I'm, I'm in. So you call the timeout. When All right, you're no, no, you, you keep going, uh, and then we'll take a break after this. Okay, perfect. So when you when you hit the ground, you know, just for the people at home, when you, you know, I don't know if people realize what it's like when Cam Newton shows up. He lands in San Diego. He's got his bags, and he says, I'm ready. You know, he doesn't come with instructions. Johnny doesn't come with instructions. Roethlisberger, they don't really come. No coach, you know, coaches will have ideas and say, well, he needs work on this, this, and this. They don't really come with a how-to book. You, you first, you, you have to have some, some input and some willingness on the athlete. And the ones that I've been in the most successful situations with, they were self-aware, one, meaning they could admit, I'm not very good at this. Or I haven't really been exposed to that. So they, if there's some self-awareness, now you know that's just some honesty, and you know it doesn't seem like a big deal. But if guys say, "I don't need to work on that," or "No, I don't think that's that important," but that's just not me. That's not who I am. I hear that a lot, less and less at this point in, in my career. But when I was younger, you'd hear quarterbacks say, "No, I'm a pro style guy. I don't really need to work on that." Self awareness is key. And then what is their pilot like? How big is their pilot like? Pilot light. Like in those water heaters, in, in terms of their pride level, how much pride do they wake up with? You know, does it matter? How much does it matter to them to, you know, to, to succeed? You know, how important is everything to them? You know, even if it's parallel parking, do they leave a tire up on the curb? And they get out and they're good, uh, does one thing. Or do they take six moves to get it because technically they're in, but they want to be equal distance in both cars? That also helps. And then, you know, just what kind of guy are they just in general? Uh, you know, are they a type A type of guy? So those factors help. That's how you kind of figure out who you're working with. And then I get on the, you know, get on the, the table, restaurant table, kitchen table, wherever we are. And I got no cards, and they got no cards. And I say, okay, if it's you, I'd say, Ryan Fowler, give me the three things you want to work on, get better at, or learn. And it's not always correcting something. Sometimes a kid in a heavy shotgun situation has not taken a whole lot of five-step drops. Therefore, if they haven't taken a whole lot of five-step drops, they probably haven't done a whole lot of play action under center either. It's a, it's a total different language for your feet. So that's something he'll write down. I've already watched most of your season. Every kid that comes after the draft, I see all their games in college. And it's a fascinating look because they're younger, they're different than when they're older. And then I've got my notes, and then I pull up your coach's notes. So if you played for Coach Saban, I would have already talked to Coach Saban, and I've got Coach Saban, your quarterback coach's notes, where thought, where you are, strengths, et cetera. I watch my own, for my own eyes. I'm looking for certain things, and then I want to get your perspective. We blend that and we share it. And then that's where the crafting starts to take place. And then, you know, some things are just non-negotiable. Your base, your, your footwork, both in terms of agility and rhythm, and then purpose, because they're all three different things. Your agility meaning you can get through ladders and cones and pick them up, and if, you know, a bear jumps out the bushes, can you hop to the other side of the trail? That, like that athleticism through the feet. And the rhythm of it, taking drops, can you keep your feet to pop, 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 bam, hit the last step, can they do that almost kind of like listening to music, can they hit and go? And, uh, you know, that's also necessary to pull into that as well. So the footwork seems broad, but you got to have that. That's non-negotiable. And then you start to address what they need. So for Cam Newton, it was weight transition. For Luck, you know, we, we worked on some things in terms of more chaotic and more done. Andrew was heavy underneath. Uh, so he wanted to do a lot of stuff and done, and he wanted to work a lot in terms of just, you know, getting pushed and flushed out of pocket. Johnny, everybody knew that. He had to get up underneath. Um, so every single thing we did in camp, he didn't take one shotgun snap in his three years of working out here. Everything was underneath. Same with Petty. Jameis, it was kind of working to kind of refine out the baseball feel in him. You know, ball kind of dropping low, getting around the belt, big stride when he's going to throw it. All those sorts of things, uh, you know, they present themselves individually. 
they're all unique cases, but if you everybody shares the information at the beginning, like a construction site, we all have the blueprints, and then you mesh them all onto one set of blueprints, and then you know you don't have a problem kind of leaving the charge, provided they're there every morning, they're aware of what's about to happen, and they're game. They come in to say, how many floors are we adding to this building today? Two? Perfect. If I work extra hard, maybe we can set the framework on the third floor. Yeah, let's go on the framework on the third floor. So we must get these two floors done. I want to transition into Blake Barnett. And I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be a responsible media guy here, okay? I, I uh, Even though I've got a little bit of a sports background as far as understanding some mechanics, not nowhere near in, in, in your level, just – you know, spotting things and being able to see what's wrong and to be able to say, well, I don't know what he's doing wrong, but I know what's wrong. It's, uh, But I watched Blake Barnett arrive here on campus back in the spring. And, you know, when you see somebody that's special, you, you just – your eyes, you, you see it quickly. And then I watched mm-hmm. him in the fall arrive last Thursday for the first practice and then went through Sunday and watched him for two and a half hours. You, you could see it very, very quickly – uh, that that this young man is special. Now, with that being said, you're in the SEC. You, a lot of things can, can happen between now and then. Uh, but I'd like to know what you thought when you first was able to lay eyes on a guy like Blake Barnett. Um, well, when I first got a chance to meet him, it was over a year ago, probably a year and a half ago, when he was coming through the Elite 11 process. And, and I get a chance. This has been nine years now with the Elite 11, five uh, five as a senior level coach with, with Trent Dilfer. Um, and we see kids all over the country. And we've had some great, you know, MVPs come through. Uh, you know, each year you see some guys who just jump out. Wake was arguably one of the best that have ever come through that process. Uh, part of what made him special then couldn't so much say that, you know, all the physical tools and everything, although he was a great athlete then and he can make you know, all kinds of throws. Then it was his competitiveness. This guy would jump on your throat out of the gate. You know, they're, they're long days at elite 11. You're with, you know, two dozen other quote unquote sharks. We, we look at it kind of like a shark tank and some guys are best things too. You know, if I'm, I'm the best quarterback in, in a five state area, you know, I'm 18 years old. Everybody knows I'm the man. I show up to elite 11 oh, my gosh, he throws as hard as I do. He throws harder than I do. He's bigger than I am. And some of those guys kind of take a step back. Some of them don't bring their sword and shield every day. And then others can't wait for the rest of the country to get there to say, perfect, I need you guys to help define me of how how much of a badass I am. And Blake was the last guy. Like, you don't have to be chesty about it. You don't have to be a trash talker. You don't have to do anything, you know, uh, over the top, just in his own presence every single day. Doesn't matter if it was an accuracy competition, if it's seven on seven, if it's this drill, that drill. Um, you know, he's sprinting, you know, kind of that young schoolboy stuff, sprinting to be the first one up. Uh, if something does kind of come off the track, show no emotion about it. I'm coming right back in the second deal. You know, some of these young guys, they kick dirt, they clap their hands. You know, they're going to say something foul, you know, just in terms of talking to themselves. Uh, but Blake is pretty ice cold at a young age. So I got a chance to see him then and quickly found out, this dude's serious. Like, this dude's serious in, like, all all facets, even when he's out here competing, and especially when he's out competing. He's pretty cold about it, too. Uh, so that was fun, and then to watch him, get down to Tuscaloosa after a, you know, a, a story recruiting path, uh, you know, was obviously exciting. Uh, and then we got a chance to work, work a lot this summer, work quite a bit this summer. Let, let me just ask you where he's at now. Uh, wh- where is he at now as he arrived on campus? Now, uh, he's eye-opening to me, uh, and that, that's just from – watching college level i've covered alabama since 2000 um i i've I've never seen a recruit that walked on campus and looks the way that blake barnett does at the quarterback perspective and i've i've covered some pretty 
pretty decent quarterbacks here in Tuscaloosa. Just one that jumps out to me. Where, where is he now in, in, in sort of your opinion? Well, you've covered some decent guys. Um, I've been around and worked with some decent guys, and I understand what I'm about to say. You know, it's going to, you know, pop some eyes open in the barbershop. But Blake is by far the best 18-year-old quarterback I've ever been around. And I've got to put that into that context because it's really where you are at certain stages. You know, I didn't know Andrew at 18. You know, I didn't know some of the rest of those kids, but he's further along than some of the prospects we've worked with when they came out of college, just physically and, and skill set-wise and things of that sort. Um, he's just, one, he's so well-rounded. You know, he he could play, I think he could he's I think he's going to be successful in that system there with, with Coach Kiffin. He would have been very successful up there with Coach Helfrich at Oregon. He could be extremely successful in Coach Shaw's system at Stanford. Those are three different vehicles now to go and try and fly, and very few guys could kind of get up, take their skill set, sit down in the cockpit, and fly all three different aircrafts. This kid can do it. Uh, he's very mature. Like, he, he just doesn't come off 18. He comes off, you know, uh, 21, 22. And a lot of that is that self-containment. You know, he's playing, he's going. You know, as a quarterback, just like a two-yard basketball, you may go 0 for 3, 0 for 4, you know, with one of those being an almost air ball, and then you got to call for the ball back. you got to trust in your shot to knock down the next one. That's how he is, uh, you know, just as a quarterback. We talked about the competitiveness. Um I laugh at Trent go for a lot. We call it that, you know, that no flinch mentality. Over my dead body, am I losing today? Over my dead body, are you beating me today? Is my team going off the field today? Um, and again, you don't need face paint and you don't have to be a towel waving guy to em- embody that. You know, some of these guys, they have it. It's just like those Wild West. Cowboys with the big trench coat. You don't know what's under that trench coat. It could be some big old shotgun. You know, you don't know. And, and that, you know, that's kind of how I always kind of envision Blake, just in terms of his demeanor. It's not going to be so much outward, but you will feel it once you get going in there with him. Um, you know, and then really, truly, he's got, when you talk about him, Ryan, he was very close with Oregon. Uh, Oregon had jumped out there. They recruited him literally saw him as having the same athleticism as a Mariota. And he'd be, you know, probably be starting at Oregon, you know, had he chose to go to Eugene. So you're talking about a kid with that type of athleticism, and those quarterbacks up there at Oregon, it's widely known, you know, the type of athletes you got to be to, you know, step in there and run that system. With an NFL caliber arm and, and, and processing ability, very smart. Uh, you know, just very sound throwing the ball, he's strong throwing the ball. You know, he can impose his will downfield, you know, with the ball in his hand. So once you start to wrap all those things together, and you got to remember to yourself, you know, this guy was in prom four months ago, <laughs> and now he's, you know, he's in Tuscaloosa and, you know, America's most storied football program and playing for one of America's most storied football coaches. Um, uh, it does lend a lot of that excitement and, and what's going to happen. It's not this season, you know, the, the season's to come. Well, as a media guy, and see, this is where I need some coaching. So if you feel free to coach me, I mean, I mean, jump in here, George. I mean, you can, you can help me out a little bit. Uh, you know, as a media guy, you know, you want to deliver to the audience what you see, but you also don't want to sound like, uh, you know, somebody that – you know, like like you know, uh, a fan. I mean, I mean, I, no doubt I'm a fan of the University of Alabama, but but I'm also a radio and a, a, a journalist, so you know, try to be professional. But you go out and you see this young man throw, and and every day in practice, and and I'm not I'm not there for the entire two hours, but I watched it early on when you gave him maybe not the best wide receivers, but just young wide receivers. And he sucked it up, and he, he he threw to those guys. And now he's starting right. to get a chance to work with the other guys. And, he, and he, to me, he was never rattled. And and when you see that at the age that he's at, you know, you start thinking, okay, at what point do you put too much on him and say, he's got a chance. If you would have asked me August the 1st, 
Ryan, where would you put your money? Would this young man mm-hmm. redshirt? I'd have said he'd redshirt 100%. I've watched him a week and one day in the practice. Every practice we're allowed to go to, I'm there. And I say right now, I don't know if you can redshirt this guy. I think he, he mm-hmm. may be the best quarterback on campus. Now, that's not saying he knows the playbook the way that the upperclassman does, but his talent is uh, – it, it's it's daylight and dark. It's It's – you know, and he jumps off to you eight days in practice, and and that's not to put more responsibility on Blake. And I, that may be the middle side that that he has to work with it too. But Nick Saban will t- take care of that. But you know, you, you as a media guy, you don't want to go out there with expectations. Uh, but he's elite. He's the real deal. No question. Um, so, yeah, Blake does. He gives. He gives away experience. Uh, just in terms of the game at this level, playbook, uh, the, the depth of knowledge. Obviously, these guys um, have, have been there. They've lived through it. They've been in meetings. They've been in the war rooms. They've been on the road. They've had a chance to watch, you know, an All-American like A.J. McCarron. Uh, they've, they've learned and studied, you know, under uh, uh, Blake last year, uh, your, your senior Blake last year. So they certainly have that. He, he can't. But it's it's hard to like jump jump that part of the process. You can't really jump that. What you can do is control kind of the things that are left on your side of the table. And and we've we've had these discussions. Be consistent as much as you can. Be consistent out there. Um, own the material that you can own. So if they've if they've installed it and they've gone over it, own it. You know, you've got your notebook, you're scratching down notes in the meetings, and you're scratching down notes in your one-on-ones. When you do get to the field, if they presented something to me today, I should be able to own that for today. I don't, you know, I may not own Chapter 20 and beyond in the playbook. You know, they may not have, A, covered it, and I may not have been here for that, but I can certainly own what they gave me today. And then you got to earn trust. If you can earn those two things, you know, the, your, your daily requirements, and then you can just go out there and be consistent. I don't think he has to be spectacular. You don't have to come out here and, you know, light the whole field up and, and come up and make all these crazy calls and, you know, piercing balls all through the red zone. But I don't, but if every time they give you an at-bat, you get on base, all right, let's give him another one. He gets on base again. He's in seven on seven. Six opportunities. At least he had the right reads, and the balls are, you know, in a good general area. All right, he's making progress, as opposed to, you know, picking out a guy, gunning it to a guy, saying, "I don't know, I just thought I'd try it." Because that's, I mean, to be honest, that that's really, you know, what happens in a lot of places. A lot of these young quarterbacks, it's overwhelming, you know, psychologically, emotionally. Guys are screaming, the speed, the game is going on, and you get the ball, and there's just a sense to do something with it as opposed to saying, all right, let me fall back on what I was trained and what I was taught to do in this situation. So, Well, in, in the know, spring, I saw that. I saw that anxiety, nervousness. Uh, he's yep. cool as a cucumber now. I mean, I, I, don't, yeah, well, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the growth or, or what, but it, it's nothing like the first day of spring. Well, remember now, let's just talk. Let's, let's go back, and I know I'm on the call because, you know, I spent a few weeks with him when he was much younger to lead 11, and I spent a couple weeks with him this summer. The two people who are guiding and crafting him and, and raising him, quote-unquote, as a quarterback, as a player, as a student there, is, is Coach Saban and Coach Kiffin. Six months, that's a good amount of time to be around those two and to absorb what they're giving you. You're talking about, you know, one of the greatest generals, one of the greatest defensive coaches of all time, of all levels, you're working against the defense. You work within his framework. You're learning leadership attributes from him and Coach Saban every day. Whether they're on the field or off the field, you're drawing from him. Then, you know, it doesn't matter to me what you say about Coach Kiffin. He's one of the best people to, to have, you know, teachers to, to raise, train, develop quarterbacks in the game. You can go back, you know, his, his credentials readily available. And all the guys he's worked with in the NFL, the exact same thing. You have those two as a battery, and you're sitting in your meeting every day, and you're around those two people, and they're bringing it. They're bringing it to you every day, coaching you hard. You know that bar at Bama never comes down. You're going to have to somehow work your way up to that. Some embrace, some step back. This kid embraces, 
you embrace, you'll progress. And like you said, you had a chance to see him back in the in the winter spring, and now you're seeing him in the summertime. The large amount, you know, of his of his uh, maturity and growth there uh, go to those two, and, it, and that's what's scary about it. You get this type of kid, this type of player, competitive talent around that battery of coaches in that you know live wire environment. Uh, I mean, it's a could you it's stunt? A mix. Could you stunt his growth? If you played him early, let's just say if he's the best that you have and you were forced to play him, maybe you simplified the offense, would it would it take a risk of stunning his growth? No, I don't think so. Here's why. A couple of things. One, it kind of goes to who he is. So we, we just talked about this. This is not a kid that flinches. Now, it's also, you know, not to say he's ready to go into, you know, LSU Tiger Stadium or he's ready to go into the swamp and, lead a two-minute drill from this, that, and the other. But he's also not a kid that's going to flinch. He's not going to go into a shell. Um, You know, you're going to take some shots on the chin. You're going to get beat up out there uh, in in many different forms and ways. But it's just what what kind of metal does he have? This kid has metal. You know, forget the whole Southern California, you know, the the cool haircut and all this stuff. This is a blue-collar, you know, this is a blue-collar overalls-wearing type kid. You know, this is one of those guys you'd find, you know, if he wasn't in a, you know, a football field, he'd probably be in a boxing gym somewhere. This, but this is a tough, this rascal's tough. So you got that. And then, yeah, again, it goes back to the two-headed monster that's there wearing the polos and visors. They can kind of frame up the game. They can call the game and call him pitches where he can get these guys down the field. They got, you know, probably the most talented locker room in America every single year they come out there. So there's guys that, you know, he can rely on, work with, lead, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if that scenario happened, I, I could see them being successful. That would be a, a steep learning curve for him. But, again, as football minds, and it's got to be 50-plus years of experience between Coach Saban and Coach Kiffin, however many championship games and, you know, however many, you know, accomplishments, those two could craft something if the scenario called for it, for him to go out and have success. Georgia, final question. I, I mean, listen, I, I could. I mean, we, we could spend till midnight, but I, I, I know that's not fair to you. I know you got to get, get a lot of things to do, and and I'm going to have to send you a slab of Dreamland ribs uh, just to pay you back. Uh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, that'll work. Ain't nothing like them nowhere, my friend. World famous right here All in right. Tuscaloosa. I'll, I'll 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 text you and get an address, and I I'll put those in the mail. I, I really will. So I look forward uh, to talking to you. But but let me let me just say this. Um, now, Ryan, you know you said that in front of millions of people. Now, no, no, I, 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 hey, they're they're my one of my main sponsors, man. So I, I'll, 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 I'll take perfect. care of you. I'll promise you. I uh, like it. And, and, right, but, I but I must it. say, if you try them, you're addicted. I'm in. Okay, so That's I mean, you, you, you'll be flying into Tuscaloosa with all those elite quarterbacks you work with, and and, and getting ribs. I mean, people flying to Tuscaloosa just to have ribs and leave for lunch. It happens all the time. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Uh, Lane Kiff, never mind. I better not say that. That's, that's probably off the record. All right. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, but I think the, the, the part that here's what jumps out to me. You said he was at, you said he looked at Oregon. He could have went yeah. there and probably been the quarterback in, in 2015. Yeah. But yeah. we're talking about a challenge of coming to the SEC. It's the best yeah. of the best. Cream of the crop. Defense, yep. nasty. What does that say about the kid? And I'm talking about Blake of saying, you know, I, I don't, I understand Oregon, I get it, but I want to go play against the best of the best. Can, can you help me? I mean, is that the mental side that you're talking about there? Yes, yes, it is, and I'm glad you opened that up. You got to, you know, you got to think about that now. If you have, you know, you think you're a good batter, let's just put it in, in slot over in baseball terms. Stay with me here. You walk out, and it's a, it's a you know a giant sports complex on this field over here you got some pretty good pitchers you know they're you know solid arms they're throwing the 60s and 70s you can go over there you know you can you can pepper the place you can put souvenirs in the stands all over the place, home run line and you look over the second field over here and they've got some really decent pitchers some guys that can hit pretty I and mean, they can hit the hit the zone pretty hard they have a curveball or two and you can go over there and play and then this field you got guys like Kershaw sitting in there, and Sabathia sitting in there, and there's a guy that's missing a couple of teeth who's known for hitting batters in the box. 
And of all three fields you choose to go and get in the, in the batter's box, you choose the last one. And that's how I look at it with Blake. This guy, he had offers from all the major conferences and, and, and all the programs, et cetera. And in a lot of their recruiting methods, a lot of these teams, and I'm sure they meant it, told him, you will start here day one. Come here, you'll start here day one. You can build this and records and legacy and Heisman's and all those sorts of things. He passes on those, and he said, I'm going to go to the, you know, to the most shark tankish <laughs> environment in college football. I'm going to go where the fan base expects championships. I'm going to go where the head coach you know, is notorious for what he demands on players, teams, quarterbacks. And I'm going to go into a conference where every single Saturday – I'm going to be looking across the defense, and out of the 11, eight are going to wind up in the NFL draft. Um, and there's no guarantee that I'll start or even play my first year. And then you then you walk up to the sign-up sheet and sign up for that situation. Like, I just think that says an awful lot, especially being a, a, a West Coast kid. I mean, you got to come over a lot of programs and a lot of conferences to, to go into that Shark Tank, uh, to sign up for that type of experience. That's what you want. He wants to be molded and coached and prepared long term. This is the long view he's taken, you know, on his on his not just education but his football career as well. So many kids, so many kids, and I can't fault him. You know, you you make decisions based on who you are. Would have easily taken the local place, the smoothest road, the nicest coach, or the most guarantees. So many, and this guy went the opposite of all those factors, and just basically lined it up. You need the best school and the best conference led by the best staff with the best general at the helm. I'm going to that spot. And according to his list, and, you know, widely known in college football, that's sitting right down there. So that spoke volumes. He doesn't want to be pandered to. He doesn't want any gifts. Uh, he's going to earn it, and he knows he's going to earn it. You know, he has to earn this to get there but if that's what you're looking for in terms of development you're in the right place george thank you so much um i greatly appreciate it uh whitfieldathletics.com it is a-t-h-l-e-t-i-x it's whitfieldathletics.com you can find him on the twitter account uh i just want to make sure that i haven't quoted you incorrectly blake barnett is the best 18 year old quarterback i've ever been around that's accurate i okay. couldn't be I, you know, I don't want to. I'm just, I'm just making you know, sure. Start I, I don't. Yeah, I, I that I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough, and, and I don't want to get a bronze statue ready for him in Canton or anything like that. He's got a lot of work well, to do. But for where he is, uh, unequivocally, and I've spent you know quite a few hours on the field uh, with an awful lot of guys. This is all I do. Uh, you know, in the fall, yeah, I put on a certain tie and talk about quarterbacks for the other <laughs> nine months uh you know our sleeves are rolled up working with him and chasing him and challenging him uh and he is he he is in that type of air 